Hi, everyone, and welcome to Talking Cancer with Dr. Roman. Now, I am a board-certified hematologist oncologist, and on this video, we are going to go over atypical ductal hyperplasia. And now this is a risk factor for breast cancer. And those of you who do not know, unfortunately, breast cancer affects about one in eight women in their lifetime. So we need to know this. And I guarantee you there are a lot of women out there who have no clue what this is. And I'm telling you, we have to change that. Okay, so with that being said, let's get started. All right, now, as with all my videos, this is for educational purposes only. I am not providing medical advice. All right, so the first thing that I want to cover is the development of the actual breast cancer. So if you can imagine, you have normal breast tissue, and then this normal breast tissue starts to become abnormal, and eventually it can become a breast cancer. Now, this abnormal breast tissue we call dysplasia, meaning abnormal cells or abnormal tissue, or atypical. And that's where the name atypical ductal hyperplasia comes from. Atypical because you already are developing abnormal cells within your breast tissue. Now, there are three entities that I want you to know about because these three are risk factors for the development of possible breast cancer in the future. And these three are atypical ductal hyperplasia. The other one is called atypical lobular hyperplasia. And finally, lobular carcinoma in situ. Now, all of these are risk factors for breast cancer. Sometimes they can become breast cancer. Now, the actual breast cancers per se are called either ductal carcinoma in situ or invasive ductal carcinoma or invasive lobular carcinoma, right? So in this video, we're, we are going to go over atypical ductal hyperplasia and what you need to know. All right, so if you're interested in actually learning about atypical lobular hyperplasia, then find this video within my channel where I go over everything that I think you need to know. And if you're interested in learning about lobular carcinoma in situ, you can find this video where I also cover everything that I think you need to know. All right, so let's start off with the anatomy of the breast so you understand where the name lobular or ductal comes from, all right? So this is a breast here, and if you can see this area here, what we call the lobes or the lobules. Okay, this is the area where your breast milk is made, all right? Now, this breast milk is taken out to your nipple through your ducts, and these are all the ducts that you have. So when we talk about atypical ductal hyperplasia, it's because cells within your ducts in this area here, they start to become abnormal. Or if we talk about atypical lobular hyperplasia, is because the cells that are becoming abnormal are in the actual lobes or lobules of the breast. So it really depends on the anatomical location where these cells are becoming abnormal that it receives its name, okay? That and the pathological findings that the pathologist, when they do the biopsy, the pathologist tells us if this is an atypical ductal hyperplasia, an atypical lobular hyperplasia, or a lobular carcinoma in situ, all right? All right, so now let's dive in specifically into atypical ductal hyperplasia. First thing I want you to know is that this is not a breast cancer, but it is a risk factor for you to develop breast cancer in the future, and that's why you need to be on top of this and you need to know this. Now, what is your risk? Well, this is a rough estimate. It's about a 20 to 30% lifetime risk, and this really varies. So I'm just quoting a very rough number here. Just know that, and this is important that you know, is that the risk increases in both breasts, not just the area that you had the biopsy in. And that's why it's important that you know this because when we go over what can we do to help prevent breast cancer, you need to know that if you have atypical ductal hyperplasia, your risk is in both breasts. All right, so how do we make the diagnosis of an atypical ductal hyperplasia? Well, chances are you either had an abnormal mammogram or an abnormal ultrasound, or maybe you felt something in the breast and you had a needle biopsy done and the pathology came back with atypical ductal hyperplasia. All right, now the, the problem with that is, if you can imagine, you only had a small needle biopsy and that biopsy is very small. It's a tiny piece of tissue. Now, the question that I would have is, 
You know, could there be something more aggressive or for example, maybe an actual breast cancer somewhere around the area? So what we usually recommend is what we call an excisional biopsy, meaning the surgeon will go in there and obtain a bigger sample just to make sure this is all atypical uh, ductal hyperplasia or could it be upgraded to something more aggressive like an actual breast cancer. So if you've been told you have atypical ductal hyperplasia, a question that I would have is, do I require an excisional biopsy so that they can obtain a bigger tissue to make sure that you don't have something else there? Okay, and the reason is you have about, and again, this is a rough estimate, about a 15% chance of you being upgraded to not just atypical ductal hyperplasia, but to having a ductal carcinoma in situ or an actual invasive breast cancer. So ask your doctor if you require an excisional biopsy. All right, so you've been told that you have atypical ductal hyperplasia. So what do we do? Well, the first thing is, if you develop breast cancer, we want to try to detect it as early as possible. So the recommendations are to have a yearly mammogram. That's the first thing. Sometimes your doctor may also recommend an ultrasound, but just know that a yearly mammogram is, is a must. The next thing is make sure you see your doctor. Again, this is a rough estimate, but about twice a year or every six months. So your doctor can thoroughly examine you. And we want to make sure we do not feel a palpable mass or a detectable lymph node under your armpit. The third thing is perform monthly self breast exams. You know, every month examine yourself, learn the anatomy of your breast. And if you feel something abnormal or something that you did not have there previously, then immediately go see your doctor. And I tell my patients, you know, try to avoid hormone replacement therapy or oral contraceptive pills because the majority of breast cancers are or have estrogen receptors, okay? They are driven by estrogen, so you do not want to add fuel to the fire if you already have a risk factor for breast cancer. Now, I get asked about breast MRIs all the time, and just know that it is not standard to follow a patient with atypical ductal hyperplasia with a breast MRI. And the main reason is that it is a very sensitive test. So it tends to detect a lot of little things in the breast, but it is not very specific. And the problem is that if patients have a breast MRI done often, then a lot of patients will have, unfortunately, breast biopsies performed. And also we found that it really, there's no evidence that it reduces mortality. So I'm not saying not to have a breast MRI, you know, this is a discussion for you to have with your doctor, but it is not considered standard. All right, now what else can we do if you have a typical ductal hyperplasia? Well, what about reducing your risk of developing breast cancer in the first place? And that's what we call chemo prevention, okay? Now, I don't want you to get scared. I'm not talking about chemotherapy, but there are pills or medications that we can take that can and will reduce your risk of developing breast cancer. And we are going to go over these in detail in the next several slides. The other option that we can uh, perform to try to reduce your risk of developing breast cancer is removing your breast, what we call a mastectomy. And unfortunately, remember, I already told you that your risk of developing breast cancer is in both breasts. So if you want this option, unfortunately, you will require a bilateral mastectomy, meaning both breasts have to be removed. Now, just know that this is not standard. This is not what we routinely recommend, although it may be considered in patients who have a very high risk of developing breast cancer. Now, what is high, ri high risk? Well, number one, if you have a typical ductal hyperplasia and maybe you have a very strong family history of breast cancer, that could be a potential reason. Or maybe you have a genetic mutation or a hereditary cancer gene that increases your risk of breast cancer. So that, together with the atypical uh, ductal hyperplasia, puts you at an even higher risk. And those are the patients that I would strongly recommend or consider at least a bilateral mastectomy. But in general, just know that we usually do not re recommend a bilateral mastectomy. All right, now let's talk about chemo prevention, the pills 
that I told you that can reduce your risk of developing breast cancer. So just know it's exactly that. These are pills that reduce your risk of breast cancer. They are all oral pills. There's no need for injections, for infusions. So that's a good thing. They are usually used for about five years. So we usually tell patients to take these pills for five years. And the neat thing is that the data suggests that once you stop the pills at five years, we see a benefit for years even after you stop the medication, okay? So that's why it's so important to really have this discussion with your doctor. If you have a typical ductal hyperplasia, are you a candidate for one of these pills? Now, just know that if you are post menopausal, okay, you stopped having a menstrual cycle, you have several options. And these are tamoxifen, raloxifen, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. Now, if you are pre-menopausal, usually you only have one option, and that is tamoxifen. Now, let's get into each one of these medications, and I'm going to tell you the good and the bad and the ugly of each one. All right, now remember to like, subscribe, and what's most important to me, share the video. All right, so let's get started with tamoxifen. Now, just know that tamoxifen is an oral medication that blocks estrogen in some organs, but it acts like an estrogen in others. And the potential benefit and risks really depends on knowing this, okay? So, for example, tamoxifen blocks estrogen within your breasts, but it acts like an estrogen within your bones, your uterus, and your clotting system. Okay, so since it blocks estrogen within your breast, it reduces the risk of the development of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And since it acts like an estrogen within your clotting system, it can increase your risk of potential blood clots or since it acts like an estrogen within your uterus, it can increase your risk of uterine cancer. Now, I don't want you to panic. This is exceedingly rare, very rare. I use tamoxifen all the time, and I cannot remember the last time I saw a blood clot or a uterus cancer because of tamoxifen. You know, these are rough estimates, but it's about 5 per 1,000 cases. Again, extremely, extremely rare. I use tamoxifen all the time. It's a very good medication. Now, since it acts like an estrogen on your bone, it can actually improve your bone density. In other words, it can help prevent or treat osteoporosis. So that's a plus about tamoxifen. The other good thing about tamoxifen is that it works both in premenopausal women and postmenopausal women. So we can use tamoxifen on everybody. The dose is 20 milligrams orally once a day. And just know that common side effects are potential hot flashes. You know, typically the hot flashes that women get once they hit menopause, also vaginal discharge or vaginal dryness. It can also cause joint pain, weight gain, and depression. I can tell you that these are not very common. Most women on tamoxifen tolerate it very well, okay? I put on here caution with smoking. I tell patients, you know, if you're a smoker, you really should not be on tamoxifen because, again, remember, tamoxifen can increase your risk of blood clots. So, so does smoking. So, those two together make me a little nervous. So, if you're a smoker, I would try to avoid tamoxifen. And also... um. The uterus cancer, since tamoxifen has that tiny risk of increasing uh, your risk of uterine cancer, you know, just make sure you're following with your gynecologist and that I usually recommend at least a yearly exam with your gynecologist and consider a pelvic ultrasound so they can look at the walls of your uterus, making sure that they are not becoming thick, okay? Also, if you are on tamoxifen, and you start spotting, especially if you're postmenopausal, you should really seek medical attention immediately because that could be an early sign of possible uterine cancer. But again, these are very rare. All right, now let's move on to raloxifen. This is also an oral estrogen blocker, and it blocks estrogen within the breast, but this one also blocks estrogen within the uterus. But it has estrogen-like effects on your bones and your clotting system. So with that in mind, you know that it will reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but it can increase the risks of blood clots. 
but it does not increase your risk of uterine cancer. And since it also acts like an estrogen in your bones, it can reduce the risk of osteoporosis or it can help improve osteoporosis. Just know that it is only indicated in postmenopausal women, so you cannot use it in premenopausal patients. And just know that in general, it is weaker than tamoxifen because a lot of patients tell me, well, if it doesn't increase your risk of uterine cancer, why not use raloxifen? Well, in general, just know that tamoxifen is a little bit stronger. So if you're a person that has a very high risk of breast cancer, I usually prefer tamoxifen for this reason. But again, you, you have to look at the risks and the benefits and then make a decision. Now, if you're a patient that has a history of a hysterectomy, then the uterine cancer issue is really not an issue anymore. So that's also something to keep in mind. The dose is 60 milligrams orally once a day. And again, as with all these pills, is given for five years. And the side effects are in general the same as tamoxifen. The hot flashes, the vaginal dryness or discharge, the joint pain, the weight gain, and the depression. And again, since just like tamoxifen, it increases your risk of blood clots, although very rare, avoid smoking. And also, if you're a person who has a history of strokes or DVT or blood clots per se, the same as tamoxifen, you should really try to avoid raloxifen. All right, now let's get into the aromatase inhibitors. And this is a family of medication that reduces the production of estrogen within your body. And there are three that I want you to know about, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. They are all very good medications. Just know that they decrease estrogen within the breast and your bone. It will reduce the risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And as I already stated, it reduces your body's estrogen levels so it can weaken your bones. In other words, it can promote osteoporosis. So if you're a person that's at risk for bone fractures or if you already have osteoporosis, maybe this medication is not ideal for you. Although sometimes we use it and we are just aggressive in managing your osteoporosis. Just like raloxifen, this medication is only used in postmenopausal patients, okay? It does not increase your blood clot risk. It does not increase your risk of uterine cancer. It's given once a day for five years, and the side effects are hot flashes, vaginal dryness, joint or muscle pain, and mood changes. Just know that aromatase inhibitors are very good medications. I use them all the time. The most common side effect that I've seen are the hot flashes and the joint pain. Usually patients complain of pain in their fingers. That's where they mainly complain. But I can tell you that for the most part, they usually tell me that it is mild to moderate. And the longer you are on one of these medications, the joint pain tends to improve. So just something that I want you to keep in mind. All right, so we're almost done. And now I'm gonna go over the key points that I want you to know about atypical ductal hyperplasia. So first of all, it is not breast cancer, but it is a risk factor for breast cancer. If you're diagnosed with this on a biopsy, ask if you require an excisional biopsy, okay? You wanna make sure that you don't have something a little more advanced than just a typical ductal hyperplasia. Very, very important. What about your yearly mammograms? Make sure you are up to date on that. Ask about anti-estrogen medications like the ones we already went over that can decrease your risk of breast cancer. If you're premenopausal, it's really only tamoxifen. If you're postmenopausal, you can use tamoxifen, raloxifen, or one of the three aromatase inhibitors. And just keep in mind that a bilateral mastectomy is an option, but it's usually reserved for those patients that have a very high risk. All right, so I really hope this video helped you out. Remember, like, subscribe, and share, share, share the video. Guys, we need to educate the public. You never know, one of these videos may just save someone's life.